Hey, Donna Lewis here, Breathe Life Ministries. And we are starting our Ezekiel Bible study. Um, and I just want to give you all a moment to log on. And I'm going to also get my Facebook up as well so that I can see when you all are asking questions. And I do encourage participation. This is an interactive Bible study where your participation is um, very much encouraged and appreciated. So uh, have your comments ready in the um, uh, of course, in the comment section, have your questions. Uh, I'm bringing you up now so that I can see it. And um, just a second here. I don't know why it does that. Oh, hey, Michelle. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. I also want to encourage you all to, you know, like and share this as well so that people are able to benefit from the lesson as well. We're getting into some really exciting times. Um, and we are uh, in the Ezekiel study that we are doing today. We are actually starting to get into the uh, prophecies, um, the actual prophecies. Um, this is going to be kind of a intense section. We're going to be covering chapters four through 10. And uh, in these passages, uh, Ezekiel begins to pronounce the judgment of God uh, on the nation of Israel and, and the kingdom of Judah as well. So before we get going too deep into this, though, um, I want to share my screen with you so that you can see the slides and we're going to do a little recap because it has been a couple weeks since we last covered ezekiel and let me just do that now okay i think this is where we want to be yes it is okay and let's see yeah Come on. Here we go. There we go. And I just need to move. Okay, good. That's not. All right. So the book of Ezekiel. We are covering this because we want to learn from the past. We want to understand the present and prepare for the future. The wonderful, awe-inspiring element of the book of Ezekiel is that the, pro the prophecies that, that he received from God were prophecies for his past, uh, excuse me, his present um, and his future. It, they were also prophecies that called to mind the past. So it is such a relevant book for us today because we are doing the same thing as, e as Ezekiel did. In other words, he, he needed to learn from his past to understand his present and prepare for the future. We are in the same position here today. And the prophetic words that Ezekiel received were not only for the time he lived in, but the time we may very live, may very well live in today. So let's move on. Okay. Uh, in Ezekiel 3, the key scripture that we covered was to receive into your heart all my words that I speak. Ezekiel was called to receive into his heart first the words of the Lord 
before he delivered them to the people of Israel. The name Ezekiel means strengthened by God, and that is a theme we will see throughout the book of Ezekiel, that his strength came from the Lord, which is a lesson for us today, that our strength comes from the Lord. He lived during the time of the temple's first destruction. He was an exile in Babylon, living along the Kabar River at the time he received his visions. He was the son of a priest and therefore called into the priesthood. He was 30 years old when he began his ministry as a prophet to the nation of Israel. We learned in Ezekiel 3 that Ezekiel was custom made by God for this calling he had, that God made him obstinate and hard hearted, and, but for the purposes of the Lord. And we, we take from that the lesson that our personalities are handcrafted by God for such a time as this. We learned from the Bible in teacher Oswald Chambers on the book of Ezekiel that when we receive God's word, it implies a personal devotion to the one who speaks that word. In other words, when we receive God's word and obey it, we are devoting ourselves to the Lord. It is an act of devotion. And we are accountable for the way we obey that word. Ezekiel in chapter three received his calling as a watchman and his, and his responsibility as a watchman was to warn, but it was not his responsibility to convince or persuade. The message itself belongs to God and Ezekiel is the messenger. In summary, we learn from chapter three that we must first internalize the message of God for ourselves. We are custom made by God for a purpose. We must remember that it is God who owns the message. We are only responsible to warn, not to convince. And God is sovereign over time and place. Love is always to be our first purpose and motivation behind everything we do. Now we're going to dive into chapters 4 through 10. I know we covered a lot of material just now and fasten your seatbelts because we're getting ready to cover even more. Um, in chapters four through 10 of the book of Ezekiel, we are going to hear over and over and over again this one phrase, then you will know I am the Lord. That phrase is used over 60 times throughout the book of Ezekiel. And we are going to hear it used over and over again in chapters 4 through 10. I want to take a moment and encourage you all that are participating in this study to read the book of Ezekiel for yourself. I have been really enjoying using my audio Bible for this, in particular, the New Living Translation audio. There's also full cast audio, which is pretty cool, where you get sound effects and everything, um, kind of like Steven Spielberg for the ears. But in, in listening to this, it, it really does begin to become much more clear um, what's happening 
and what's being communicated. Now, chapter four, we begin to see Ezekiel's personality and his teaching style come out. Ezekiel was a highly visual teacher. He made use of models. He created little cities. He, he created an entire model of the city of Jerusalem uh, using pots and pans. And he drew on a, on, a, on a piece of clay a map of Israel. Uh, he was instructed to make use of even meals, meal preparation, so that he could illustrate for the people of Israel that food was going to be very scarce. He took swords and his own hair to demonstrate and act out the scattering and the slaughter of the people in Jerusalem by the Babylonians. He spared nothing to make sure that he could communicate clearly to his audience what was being said, what was getting ready to take place. In Ezekiel 4, 4 through 6, God calls Israel, excuse me, calls Ezekiel to actually bear the sin, bear the iniquity of the nation of Israel and the kingdom of Judah on himself. A day for every year they rebelled. And I am not sure how he how he did this. He the Lord speaks to him and says, I'm going to actually put ropes on you so that you can't turn from your from your right to your left, because he was actually called to lay on one side of his body for over a year, 390 days, and then roll over and lay on the other side of his body for 40 days. I don't know how he did this without becoming stricken by pain. I don't know if God gave him little breaks so that he could get up and stretch. But he was called to lay on his side for over a year, bearing the iniquity of Israel, and then roll over and lay on his other side to bear the sin of Judah for 40 days. This calls to mind how Christ bore our sins in 2 Corinthians 5 21 it reads that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ We are called into that ministry of reconciliation to God now. And we are called to declare the gospel of peace. Ezekiel was called to bear the sin of his nation and warn them of the coming judgments. Christ took our punishment and then called us to the ministry of reconciliation. In chapters five through seven, Ezekiel continues to act out the destruction that's coming to Israel as a result of their rebellion. He shaves his hair and God tells him to tie it up in his robes and scatter it and chop it with a sword to demonstrate the slaughter and the humiliation that is coming to Jerusalem. 
and the high places where they committed their horrendous acts of idolatry. He actually is called to prophesy against the mountains where, where Israel participated in these grotesque pagan worship ceremonies. And Ezekiel declares the judgment against those places where there's going to be slaughter at every idolatrous shrine. And then in chapter seven, we see that God is declaring that there will be no hope of escape, that this judgment is final and certain and is most definitely coming and no one is going to escape. In chapters eight through 10, it's heartbreaking. Ezekiel is taken in a very breathtaking vision on a virtual reality trip into the temple itself. And he's told to dig through the wall where he witnesses grotesque, idolatrous worship going on by the priests and the women of Israel. The priests are worshiping the sun and the women are mourning for another, another false god. And there's pagan symbols all over the walls of the temple. And then God calls out the henchmen. But before he sends them out to slaughter, he tells a scribe to seal a remnant that hasn't participated in this idolatrous worship, in the corruption that's going on. We see a very similar scene played out in the book of Revelation. And again, this calls to our attention how much the book of Revelation is a mirror of the book of Ezekiel. Once the faithful remnant are sealed by the scribe, then the henchmen are sent out and the slaughter begins. And once it's all completed, they report back to God and say, it's done. We've done exactly as you've, you've asked. It's extremely somber and I can't imagine what went through Ezekiel's heart when this began to take place. At one point when he was hearing the, the judgments being brought against Israel, he pleaded to God, just like Moses pleaded to God, to spare the nation. God's like, no, we're done. It's over. We're, 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 there is their, their corruption, their murders, their idolatries have risen to the point where judgment is the only just response. God literally tells the people of Israel through these judgments that he has become their enemy. And that they will now be an example for the rest of the nations of what God's wrath 
looks like. And that their conduct of rebellion, corruption, and detestable worship exceeded the nations around them. It's, it's, it was, it's heartbreaking. Then when we get to chapter 10, the glory of the Lord evacuates the temple and leaves. This is particularly heartbreaking because God had to leave his home because he couldn't be in that corruption. They had defiled his home and he had to leave it. And then he defiled it by, he, by calling in the Babylonians to come in and completely destroy it. The nation of Israel was unique because they were allowed the awesome privilege of dwelling with God and being the priests of his worship and the intercessors between God and man. They had a calling on their life unlike any other nation in the world. they had lost sight of that. And they literally believed, we see in, in these chapters between four and 10, that they actually believed God had abandoned them and didn't even see or care what they did. And God was telling them throughout these chapters how wrong they were, that he did see, he had never abandoned them, and he did care to the point that his heart is breaking over their idolatry, their infidelity, and their corruption, the murder that was flowing through their streets, the profiteering on crisis, the secret deals being made between themselves and enemy nation states. God saw it all and took note of it. And when it had become full to the brim and beginning to overflow, that's when he said no more. And this is the state that they found themselves in. And the reason why his judgments were so severe and absolutely final. And again, he reminds them over and over again that you will know I am the Lord. Pretty sobering stuff. Pretty intense stuff. 
what is our takeaway from all of this? And I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share now. What is our takeaway? I'm going to ask you that. Put in the comments, what do you see as the takeaway from all of this? For me, my biggest takeaway is actually this. Israel's downfall began when they entertained the thought that God had abandoned them and that God didn't see or care to see what was happening within their nation. A slippery slope of, excuse me, of peril is when we begin to believe that God doesn't care. One of the things I was listening to yesterday um, in a different book I was listening to on audio um, described how important it, it was. A, it's a book on spiritual warfare and the author was stating that when we get into trouble, when we get into, when I say trouble, I mean peril, when we're going through really hard times, when we're going through dangerous times and frightening times and discouraging times, how important it is to offer the sacrifice of praise. And I have to believe that the reason for that is so that we are reminding ourselves that God is near and not far away. The Spirit of the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So when we praise him, we remember he is close and not far, that his eyes are on us and not drifting to some irrelevant place. The Israelites believed God didn't care. And so they began worshiping other false gods. And their corruption grew into something that even made the nations around them blush. They slipped into such hard depravity that they slaughtered their own children and murdered innocents in the streets and profiteered off the heartbreak of others. My encouragement that I take from this is that God always sees. God always cares. God is always near and not far off. The other thing I want to 
make note of is that in the chapters that are coming up next week, we're going to see that even though he took hope and said, don't have any in these chapters, he brings the hope back in the chapters to come. And before Ezekiel ends, we will see great hope in front of us. In the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah was a contemporary of Ezekiel, Isaiah prophesied that God's anger lasts for a moment, but his mercy for a lifetime. And I think that is also something for us to remember that God's mercy is a lifetime. Is a lifetime. And I also have to point out another another element that really stood out to me, and that is actually, and it, and it came to my attention even as I was going through this with you today, and that is um, where he declares to Israel that he's become their enemy. He used to go before them in battle. He used to be the enemy of their enemies, but now they had become even worse than their enemies, so now God was their enemy. But in Romans, we read how God, through Jesus Christ, drew us who were his enemy into himself. Um, I'm trying to think exactly how that passage was phrased. While we were yet sinners, but another translation of that reads enemies. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. God's love is immense. It's infinite. Don't ever believe you have drifted too far that his mercy cannot reach you. And on that, I'm going to go ahead and end this study of Ezekiel. And I will be back with more of Ezekiel, and we'll be buzzing chapters again, because we got a lot of ground to cover. There's like 48 chapters in the book of Ezekiel, so we kind of got to hit these hard, <laughs> but we will get through. All right, guys, love you much, and uh, we will see you again right here at Breathe Life Ministries. Please like and share this video. Please leave your comments in the comment sections. I always see them and I always respond. God bless. Love you.